The Unique Hamlet Being an Unrecorded Adventure of Mr. Sherlock Holmes by Vincent Starrett Chapter 1 Holmes, said I one morning, as I stood in our bay window, looking idly into the street, surely here comes a madman. Someone has incautiously left the door open and the poor fellow has slipped out. What a pity! It was a glorious morning in the spring, with a fresh breeze and inviting sunlight. But as it was early, few persons were as yet astir. Birds twittered under the neighbouring eaves, and from the far end of the thoroughfare came faintly the droning cry of an umbrella repairman. A lean cat slunk across the cobbles and disappeared into a courtway. But for the most part the street was deserted, save for the eccentric individual who had called forth my exclamation. Sherlock Holmes rose lazily from the chair in which he had been lounging and came to my side, standing with long legs spread and hands in the pockets of his dressing gown. He smiled as he saw the singular personage coming along, and a personage the man seemed to be, despite his curious actions, for he was tall and portly, with elderly whiskers of the variety called mutton chop, and eminently respectable. He was loping curiously, like a tired hound, lifting his knees high as he ran, and a heavy double watch chain bounced against and rebounded from the plump line of his figured waistcoat. With one hand he clutched despairingly at his tall silk hat, while with the other he made strange gestures in the air in a state of emotion bordering on distraction. We could almost see the spasmodic workings of his countenance. "'What in the world can ail him?' I cried, seeing how he glances at the houses as he passes. "'He is looking at the numbers,' responded Sherlock Holmes, with dancing eyes, "'and I fancy it is ours that will give him the greatest happiness. His profession, of course, is obvious. A banker, I should imagine, or at least a person of affluence,' I ventured, wondering what curious detail had betrayed the man's vocation to my remarkable companion in a single glance. "'Affluent, yes,' said Holmes, with a mischievous twinkle, "'but not exactly a banker, Watson. Notice the sagging pockets, despite the excellence of his clothing, and the rather exaggerated madness of his eye. He is a collector, or I am very much mistaken.' "'My dear fellow!' I exclaimed. "'At his age and in his situation. And why should he be seeking us? When we settled that last bill of books!' said my friend severely. He is a book collector. His line is Caxton's, Elzevir's, and Gutenberg Bibles. Not the sordid reminders of unpaid grocery accounts. See, he is turning in as I expected, and in a moment he will stand upon our hearthrug and tell the harrowing tale of a unique volume and its extraordinary disappearance. His eyes gleamed, and he rubbed his hands together in satisfaction. I could not but hope that his conjecture was correct, for he had had little recently to occupy his mind, and I lived in constant fear that he would seek that stimulation his active brain required in the long-tabooed cocaine bottle. As Holmes finished speaking, the doorbell echoed through the house. Then hurried feet were sounding on the stairs, while the wailing voice of Mrs. Hudson, raised in protest, could only have been occasioned by frustration of her coveted privilege of bearing up our caller's card. Then the door burst violently inward, and the object of our analysis staggered to the centre of the room and pitched head foremost upon our centre rug. There he lay, a magnificent ruin, with his head on the fringed border and his feet in the coal scuttle, and sealed within his motionless lips was the amazing story he had come to tell, for that it was amazing we could not doubt, in the light of our client's extraordinary behaviour. Sherlock Holmes ran quickly for the brandy, while I knelt beside the stricken man and loosened his wilted neckband. 
he was not dead. And when we had forced the flask between his teeth, he sat up in groggy fashion, passing a dazed hand across his eyes. Then he scrambled to his feet with an embarrassed apology for his weakness, and fell into the chair which Holmes invitingly held toward him. That is right, Mr. Harrington Edwards, said my companion soothingly. Be quite calm, my dear sir, and when you have recovered your composure you will find us ready to listen. You know me, then? cried our visitor. There was pride in his voice, and he lifted his eyebrows in surprise. I had never heard of you until this moment. But if you wish to conceal your identity, it would be well, said Sherlock Holmes, for you to leave your book plates at home. As Holmes spoke, he returned a little package of folded paper slips, which he had picked from the floor. They fell from your hat when you had the misfortune to collapse, he added whimsically. Yes, yes, cried the collector, a deep blush spreading across his features. I remember now. My hat was a little large, and I folded a number of them and placed them beneath the sweatband. I had forgotten. Rather shabby usage for a handsome etched plate, smiled my companion. But that is your affair. And now, sir, if you are quite at ease, let us hear what it is that has brought you, a collector of books, from Polk Stoges Manor, the name is on the plate, to the office of Sherlock Holmes, consulting expert in crime. Surely nothing but the theft of Mohammed's own copy of the Koran can have affected you so strongly. Mr. Harrington Edwards smiled feebly at the jest, then sighed. Alas, he murmured, if that were all. But I shall begin at the beginning. You must know, then, that I am the greatest Shakespearean commentator in the world. My collection of Anna is unrivalled, and much of the world's collection, and consequently its knowledge of the veritable Shakespeare, has emanated from my pen. One book I did not possess. It was unique in the correct sense of that abused word. The greatest Shakespeare rarity in the world. Few knew that it existed, for its existence was kept a profound secret among a chosen few. Had it become known that this book was in England, anywhere, indeed, its owner would have been hounded to his grave by wealthy Americans. It was in the possession of my friend. I tell you this in the strictest confidence of my friend, Sir Nathaniel Brooke Bannerman, whose place at Walton-on-Walton Walton is next to my own. A scant two hundred yards separate our dwellings. So intimate has been our friendship that a few years ago the fence between our estates was removed, and each of us roamed or loitered at will in the other's preserves. For some years now, I have been at work upon my greatest book, my magnum opus. It was to be my last book, also embodying the results of a lifetime of study and research. Sir, I know Elizabethan London better than any man alive. Better than any man who ever lived, I think. He burst suddenly into tears. There, there, said Holmes gently. Do not be distressed. Pray continue with your interesting narrative. What was this book? which, I take it, in some manner, has disappeared? You borrowed it from your friend? That is what I am coming to, said Mr. Harrington Edwards, drying his tears. But as for help, Mr. Holmes, I fear that is beyond even you, as you surmise I needed this book. Knowing its value, which could not be fixed, for the book is priceless, and knowing Sir Nathaniel's idolatry of it, I hesitated before asking for the loan of it. But I had to have it, for without it my work could not have been completed. And at length I made my request. I suggested that I visit him and go through the volume under his eyes, he sitting at my side throughout my entire examination, and servants stationed at every door and window, with fowling pieces in their hands. 
You can imagine my astonishment when Sir Nathaniel laughed at my precautions. My dear Edwards, he said, that would be all very well were you Arthur Rambidge or Sir Homer Nantes, mentioning the two great men of the British Museum, or were you Mr. Henry Hutterson, the American railway magnate. But you are my friend, Harrington Edwards, and you shall take the book home with you for as long as you like. I protested vigorously, I can assure you, but he would have it so. And as I was touched by this mark of his esteem, at length I permitted him to have his way. My God, if I had remained adamant, if I had only... He broke off, and for a moment stared blindly into space. His eyes were directed at the Persian slipper on the wall, in the toe of which Holmes kept his tobacco. But we could see that his thoughts were far away. Come, Mr. Edwards, said Holmes firmly. You are agitating yourself unduly, and you are unreasonably prolonging our curiosity. You have not yet told us what this book is. Mr. Harrington Edwards gripped the arm of the chair in which he sat. Then he spoke, and his voice was low and thrilling. The book was a Hamlet quarto, dated 1602, presented by Shakespeare to his friend Drayton, with an inscription four lines in length written and signed by the master himself. My dear sir, I exclaimed. Holmes blew a long, slow whistle of astonishment. It is true cried the collector. That is the book I borrowed, and that is the book I lost. The long-sought quarto of 1602, actually inscribed in Shakespeare's own hand. His greatest drama, in an edition dated a year earlier than any that is known. A perfect copy. And with four lines in his own handwriting, unique, extraordinary, amazing, Astounding, colossal, incredible, un— He seemed wound up to continue indefinitely, but Holmes, who had sat quite still at first, shocked by the importance of the loss, interrupted the flow of adjectives. I appreciate your emotion, Mr. Edwards, he said. And the book is indeed all that you say it is. Indeed, it is so important that we must at once attack the problem of rediscovering it. The book, I take it, is readily identifiable? Mr. Holmes, said our client earnestly, it would be impossible to hide it. It is so important a volume that, upon coming into its possession, Sir Nathaniel Brooke Bannerman called a consultation of the great binders of the Empire, at which were present... Mr. Riviere, Messrs. Sangorsky and Sutcliffe, Mr. Zainsdorf, and certain others. They, and myself, with two others, alone know of the book's existence. When I tell you that it is bound in brown Levant Morocco, with leather joints and brown Levant doubleur and fly leaves, the whole elaborately gold tooled, inlaid with seven hundred and fifty separate pieces of various coloured leathers, and enriched by the insertion of eighty-seven precious stones, I need not add that it is a design that never will be duplicated, and I mention only a few of its glories. The binding was personally done by Messrs. Riviere, Sangorsky, Sutcliffe, and Zainsdorf, working alternately, and is a work of such enchantment that any man might gladly die a thousand deaths for the privilege of owning it for twenty minutes. Dear me, quoth Sherlock Holmes, it must indeed be a handsome volume, and from your description, together with a realisation of its importance by reason of its association, I gather that it is something beyond what might be termed a valuable book. Priceless! cried Mr. Harrington Edwards. The combined wealth of India, Mexico, and Wall Street would be all too little for its purchase. You are anxious to recover this book? asked Sherlock Holmes, looking at him keenly. 
My God! shrieked the collector, rolling up his eyes and clawing at the air with his hands. Do you suppose— Tut, tut! Holmes interrupted. I was only teasing you. It is a book that might move even you, Mr. Harrington Edwards, to theft. But we may put aside that notion. Your emotion is too sincere, and besides you know too well the difficulties of hiding such a volume as you describe. Indeed, only a very daring man would purloin it and keep it long in his possession. Pray tell us how you came to lose it. Mr. Harrington Edwards seized the brandy flask, which stood at his elbow, and drained it at a gulp. With the renewed strength thus obtained, he continued his story. As I have said, Sir Nathaniel forced me to accept the loan of the book, much against my wishes. On the evening that I called for it, he told me that two of his servants, heavily armed, would accompany me across the grounds to my home. There is no danger, he said, but you will feel better. And I heartily agreed with him. How shall I tell you what happened? Mr. Holmes, it was those very servants who assailed me and robbed me of my priceless borrowing. Sherlock Holmes rubbed his lean hands with satisfaction. Splendid, he murmured. This is a case after my own heart. Watson, these are deep waters in which we are adventuring. But you are rather lengthy about this, Mr. Edwards. Perhaps it will help matters if I ask you a few questions. By what road did you go to your home? By the main road, a good highway, which lies in front of our estates. I preferred it to the shadows of the wood, and there were some two hundred yards between your doors. At what point did the assault occur? Almost midway between the two entrance drives, I should say. There was no light? That of the moon only. Did you know these servants who accompanied you? One I knew slightly, the other I had not seen before. Describe them to me, please. The man who is known to me is called Miles. He is clean-shaven, short and powerful, although somewhat elderly. He was known, I believe, as Sir Nathaniel's most trusted servant. He had been with Sir Nathaniel for years. I cannot describe him minutely, for, of course, I never paid much attention to him. The other was tall and thick-set, and wore a heavy beard. He was a silent fellow. I do not believe that he spoke a word during the journey. Miles was more communicative? Oh, yes, even garrulous, perhaps. He talked about the weather and the moon, and I forget what else. Never about books? There was no mention of books between any of us. Just how did the attack occur? It was very sudden. We had reached, as I say, about the halfway point, when the big man seized me by the throat. To prevent outcry, I suppose, and on the instant, Miles snatched the volume from my grasp and was off. In a moment his companion followed him. I had been half-throttled and could not immediately cry out. But when I could articulate... I made the countryside ring with my cries. I ran after them, but failed even to catch another sight of them. They had disappeared completely. Did you all leave the house together? Miles and I left together. The second man joined us at the porter's lodge. He had been attending to some of his duties. And Sir Nathaniel, where was he? He said good night on the threshold. What has he had to say about all this? I have not told him. You have not told him? echoed Sherlock Holmes in astonishment. I have not dared, confessed our client miserably. It will kill him. That book was the breath of his life. When did all this occur? I put in, with a glance at Holmes. Excellent, Watson, said my friend, answering my glance. I was just about to ask the same question— just last night, was Mr. Harrington Edwards' reply. I was crazy most of the night, and didn't sleep a wink. I came to you the first thing this morning. Indeed, I tried to raise you on the telephone last night, but could not establish a connection. Yes, 
said Holmes reminiscently. We were attending Madame Trentini's first night. We dined later at Albani's. Oh, Mr. Holmes, do you think you can help me? cried the abject collector. I trust so, answered my friend cheerfully. Indeed, I am certain I can. Such a book, as you remark, is not easily hidden. What say you, Watson, to a run-down to Walton on Walton? There is a train in half an hour, said Mr. Harrington Edwards, looking at his watch. Will you return with me? No, no, laughed Holmes. That would never do. We must not be seen together just yet, Mr. Edwards. Go back yourself on the first train, by all means, unless you have further business in London. My friend and I will go together. There is another train this morning? An hour later. Excellent. Until we meet, then. Chapter 2 We took the train from Paddington Station an hour later, as we had promised, and began our journey to Walton-on-Walton, -Walton, a pleasant, aristocratic little village, and the scene of the curious accident to our friend of Poke Stogius Manor. Sherlock Holmes, lying back in his seat, blew earnest smoke rings at the ceiling of our compartment, which fortunately was empty, while I devoted myself to the morning paper. After a bit I tired of this occupation and turned to Holmes to find him looking out of the window, wreathed in smiles, and quoting Horace softly under his breath. "'You have a theory?' I asked, in surprise. It is a capital mistake to theorise in advance of the evidence, he replied. Still, I have given some thought to the interesting problem of our friend Mr. Harrington Edwards, and there are several indications which can point to only one conclusion. And whom do you believe to be the thief? My dear fellow, said Sherlock Holmes, you forget we already know the thief. Edwards has testified quite clearly that it was Miles who snatched the volume. True, I admitted, abashed. I had forgotten. All we must do, then, is to find Miles. And a motive, added my friend, chuckling. What would you say, Watson, was the motive in this case? Jealousy, I replied. You surprise me. Miles had been bribed by a rival collector, who in some manner had learned about this remarkable volume. You remember Edwards told us this second man joined them at the lodge. That would give an excellent opportunity for the substitution of a man other than the servant intended by Sir Nathaniel. Is not that good reasoning? You surpass yourself, my dear Watson, murmured Holmes. It is excellently reasoned, and, as you justly observe, the opportunity for a substitution was perfect. Do you not agree with me? Hardly, Watson. A rival collector, in order to accomplish this remarkable coup, first would have to have known of the volume, as you suggest, but also he must have known upon what night Mr. Harrington Edwards would go to Sir Nathaniel's to get it, which would point to collaboration on the part of our client. As a matter of fact, however, Mr. Edwards's decision to accept the loan was, I believe, sudden and without previous determination. I do not recall his saying so. He did not say so, but it is a simple deduction. A book collector is mad enough to begin with Watson, but tempt him with some such bait as this Shakespeare quarto, and he is bereft of all sanity. Mr. Edwards would not have been able to wait. It was just the night before that Sir Nathaniel promised him the book and it was just last night that he flew to accept the offer, flying incidentally to disaster also. The miracle is that he was able to wait an entire day. Wonderful, I cried, elementary, said Holmes. If you are interested, you will do well to read Harley Graham on Transcendental Emotion, while I have myself been guilty of a small brochure in which I catalogue some twelve hundred professions and the emotional effect upon their members of unusual tidings, good and bad. We were the only passengers to alight at Walton-on-Walton, -Walton, but rapid inquiry developed that Mr. Harrington Edwards had returned on the previous train. 
Holmes, who had disguised himself before leaving the coach, did all the talking. He wore his cap peak backward, carried a pencil behind his ear, and had turned up the bottoms of his trousers, while from one pocket dangled the end of a linen tape measure. He was a municipal surveyor to the life, and I could not but think that, meeting him suddenly in the highway, I should not myself have known him. At his suggestion I dented the crown of my hat and turned my jacket inside out. Then he gave me an end of the tape measure, while he, carrying the other, went on ahead. In this fashion, stopping from time to time to kneel in the dust, and ostensibly to measure sections of the roadway, we proceeded toward Pokestogis Manor. The occasional villagers whom we encountered on their way to the station paid us no more attention than if we had been rabbits. Shortly we came in sight of our friend's dwelling, a picturesque and rambling abode sitting far back in its own grounds, and bordered by a square of sentinel oaks. A gravel pathway led from the roadway to the house entrance, and, as we passed, the sunlight struck fire from an antique brass knocker on the door. The whole picture, with its background of gleaming countryside, was one of rural calm and comfort. We could with difficulty believe it the scene of the curious problem we had come to investigate. "'We shall not enter yet,' said Sherlock Holmes, passing the gate leading into our client's acreage. "'But we shall endeavour to be back in time for luncheon.' From this point the road progressed downward in a gentle decline, and the vegetation grew more thickly on either side of the road. Sherlock Holmes kept his eyes stolidly on the path before us, and when we had covered about a hundred yards he stopped. Here, he said, pointing, the assault occurred. I looked closely at the earth, but could see no sign of struggle. You recall it was midway between the two houses that it happened, he continued. No, there are few signs. There was no violent tussle. Fortunately, however, we had our proverbial fall of rain last evening, and the earth has retained impressions nicely. He indicated the faint imprint of a foot, then another, and still another. Kneeling down, I was able to see that, indeed, many feet had passed along the road. Holmes flung himself at full length in the dirt and wriggled swiftly about, his nose to the earth, muttering rapidly in French, then he whipped out a glass, the better to examine something that had caught his eye, but in a moment he shook his head in disappointment and continued with his exploration. I was irresistibly reminded of a noble hound, at fault sniffing in circles in an effort to re-establish a lost scent. In a moment, however, he had it, for with a little cry of pleasure he rose to his feet, zigzagged curiously across the road, and paused before a bridge, a lean finger pointing accusingly at a break in the thicket. No wonder they disappeared, he smiled as I came up. Edwards thought they continued up the road, but here is where they broke through. Then, stepping back a little distance, he ran forward lightly and cleared the hedge at a bound. Follow me carefully, he warned, for we must not allow our own footprints to confuse us. I fell more heavily than my companion, but in a moment he had me up and helped me to steady myself. See, he cried, examining the earth, and deep in the mud and grass I saw the prints of two pairs of feet. The small man broke through, said Sherlock Holmes exultantly, but the larger rascal leapt over the hedge. See how deeply his prints are marked. He landed heavily here in the soft ooze. It is significant, Watson, that they came this way. Does it suggest nothing to you? That they were men who knew Edwards's grounds as well as the Brook Bannerman estate, I answered, and thrilled with pleasure at my friend's nod of approbation. He flung himself upon the ground without further conversation, and for some moments we both crawled painfully across the grass. Then a shocking thought occurred to me. Holmes, I whispered in dismay, do you see where these footprints tend? 
They are directed towards the home of our client, Mr. Harrington Edwards. He nodded his head slowly, and his lips were tight and thin. The double line of impressions ended abruptly at the back door of Poke Stoges Manor. Sherlock Holmes rose to his feet and looked at his watch. We are just in time for luncheon, he announced, and brushed off his garments. Then, deliberately, he knocked upon the door. In a few moments we were in the presence of our client. We have been roaming about in the neighbourhood, apologised the detective, and took the liberty of coming to your rear door. You have a clue? asked Mr Harrington Edwards eagerly. A queer smile of triumph sat upon Holmes's lips. Indeed, he said quietly. I believe I have solved your little problem, Mr. Harrington Edwards. My dear Holmes, I cried, and my dear sir, cried our client. I have yet to establish a motive, confessed my friend. But as to the main facts, there can be no question. Mr. Harrington Edwards fell into a chair. He was white and shaking. The book, he croaked, tell me. Patience, my good sir counselled Holmes kindly. We have had nothing to eat since sun-up, and we are famished, all in good time. Let us first have luncheon, and then all shall be made clear. Meanwhile, I should like to telephone to Sir Nathaniel Brook Bannerman, for I wish him also to hear what I have to say. Our client's pleas were in vain. Holmes would have his little joke and his luncheon, in the end, Mr. Harrington Edwards staggered away to the kitchen to order a repast, and Sherlock Holmes talked rapidly and unintelligibly into the telephone and came back with a smile on his face. But I asked no questions. In good time, this extraordinary man would tell his story in his own way. I had heard all that he had heard, yet I was completely at sea. Still, our host's ghastly smile hung heavily in my mind, and come what would, I felt sorry for him. In a little time we were seated at table. Our client, haggard and nervous, ate slowly and with apparent discomfort. His eyes were never long absent from Holmes's inscrutable face. I was little better off, but Sherlock Holmes ate with gusto, relating, meanwhile, a number of his earlier adventures, which I may some day give to the world, if I am able to read my illegible notes made on the occasion. When the dreary meal had been concluded, we went into the library, where Sherlock Holmes took possession of the easiest chair, with an air of proprietorship that would have been amusing in other circumstances. He screwed together his long pipe and lighted it with almost malicious lack of haste, while Mr. Harrington Edwards perspired against the mantel in an agony of apprehension. "'Why must you keep us waiting, Mr. Holmes?' he whispered. "'Tell us at once, please, who... who...' His voice trailed off into a moan. "'The criminal,' said Sherlock Holmes smoothly, "'is Sir Nathaniel Brooke Bannerman,' said a maid suddenly putting her head in at the door, and on the heels of her announcement stalked the handsome baronet, whose priceless volume had caused all this commotion and unhappiness. Sir Nathaniel was white, and he appeared ill. He burst at once into talk. "'I have been much upset by your call,' he said, looking meanwhile at our client." You say you have something to tell me about the quarto. Don't say that anything has happened to it. He clutched nervously at the wall to steady himself, and I felt deep pity for the unhappy man. Mr. Harrington Edwards looked at Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Mr. Holmes, he cried pathetically. Why did you send for him? Because, said my friend, I wish him to hear the truth about the Shakespeare Quarto. Sir Nathaniel, I believe you have not been told as yet that Mr. Edwards was robbed last night of your precious volume. 
robbed by the trusted servants whom you sent with him to protect it. What? screamed the titled collector. He staggered and fumbled madly at his heart, then collapsed into a chair. My God, he muttered, and then again, My God! I should have thought you would have been suspicious of evil when your servants did not return, pursued the detective. I have not seen them, whispered Sir Nathaniel. I do not mingle with my servants. I did not know they had failed to return. Tell me, tell me all. Mr. Edwards, said Sherlock Holmes, turning to our client, will you repeat your story, please? Mr. Harrington Edwards, thus adjured, told the unhappy tale again, ending with a heartbroken cry of, Oh, Nathaniel, can you ever forgive me? I do not know that it was entirely your fault, observed Holmes cheerfully. Sir Nathaniel's own servants are the guilty ones, and surely he sent them with you. But you said you had solved the case, Mr. Holmes, cried our client, in a frenzy of despair. Yes, agreed Holmes, it is solved. You have had the clue in your own hands ever since the occurrence, but you did not know how to use it. It all turns upon the curious actions of the taller servant prior to the assault. The actions of, stammered Mr. Harrington Edwards, why, he did nothing, said nothing. That is the curious circumstance, said Sherlock Holmes. Sir Nathaniel got to his feet with difficulty. Mr. Holmes, he said, this has upset me more than I can tell you. Spare no pains to recover the book and to bring to justice the scoundrels who stole it. But I must go away and think. Think. Stay, said my friend. I have already caught one of them. What? Where? cried the two collectors together. Here, said Sherlock Holmes, and stepping forward, he laid a hand on the baronet's shoulder. You, Sir Nathaniel, were the taller servant. You were one of the thieves who throttled Mr. Harrington Edwards and took from him your own book. And now, sir, will you tell us why you did it? Sir Nathaniel Brooke Bannerman staggered and would have fallen had not I rushed forward and supported him. I placed him in a chair. As we looked at him, we saw confession in his eyes. Guilt was written in his haggard face. Come, come, said Holmes impatiently. Or will it make it easier for you if I tell the story as it occurred? Let it be so, then. You parted with Mr. Harrington Edwards on your door sill, Sir Nathaniel, bidding your best friend good night with a smile on your lips and evil in your heart. And as soon as you had crossed the door, you slipped into an enveloping raincoat, turned up your collar, and hastened by a shorter road to the porter's lodge, where you joined Mr. Edwards and Miles as one of your own servants. You spoke no word at any time, because you feared to speak. You were afraid Mr. Edwards would recognize your voice, while your beard, hastily assumed, protected your face. And in the darkness your figure passed unnoticed. Having strangled and robbed your best friend then of your own book, you and your scoundrelly assistant fled across Mr. Edwards's fields to his own back door, thinking that, if investigation followed, I would be called in and would trace those footprints and fix the crime upon Mr. Harrington Edwards as part of a criminal plan prearranged with your rascally servants who would be supposed to be in the pay of Mr. Edwards and the ringleaders in a counterfeit assault upon his person. Your mistake, sir, was in ending your trail abruptly at Mr. Edwards' back door. Had you left another trail, then, leading back to your own domicile, I should unhesitatingly have arrested Mr. Harrington Edwards for the theft. Surely you must know that in criminal cases handled by me it is never the obvious situation that is the correct one. The mere fact that the finger of suspicion is made to point at a certain individual is sufficient to absolve that individual from guilt. Had you read the little works of my friend and colleague Dr. Watson, you would not have made such a mistake. Yet you claim to be a bookman. 
A low moan from the unhappy baronet was his only answer. To continue, however, there at Mr. Edward's own back door, you ended your trail, entering his house, his own house, and spending the night under his roof, while his cries and ravings over his loss filled the night and brought joy to your unspeakable soul. And in the morning, when he had gone forth to consult me, you quietly left, you and Miles, and returned to your own place by the beaten highway. Mercy! cried the defeated wretch, cowering in his chair. If it is made public, I am ruined. I was driven to it. I could not let Mr. Edwards examine the book, for that way exposure would follow. Yet I could not refuse him, my best friend, when he asked its loan. Your words tell me all that I did not know, said Sherlock Holmes sternly. The motive now is only too plain. The work, sir, was a forgery, and knowing that your erudite friend would discover it, you chose to blacken his name to save your own. Was the book insured? Insured for one hundred thousand pounds, he told me, interrupted Mr. Harrington Edwards excitedly. So that he planned at once to dispose of this dangerous and dubious item and to reap a golden reward, commented Holmes. Come, sir, tell us about it. How much of it was forgery? Merely the inscription? I will tell you, said the baronet suddenly, and throw myself upon the mercy of my friend, Mr. Edwards. The whole book, in effect, was a forgery. It was originally made up of two imperfect copies of the 1604 quarto. Out of the pair I made one perfect volume, and a skilful workman, now dead, changed the date for me so cleverly that only an expert of the first water could have detected it. Such an expert, however, is Mr. Harrington Edwards, the one man in the world who could have unmasked me. Thank you, Nathaniel said Mr. Harrington Edwards gratefully. The inscription, of course, also was forged, continued the baronet. You may as well know everything. And the book? asked Holmes. Where did you destroy it? A grim smile settled on Sir Nathaniel's features. It is even now burning in Mr. Edwards' own furnace, he said. Then it cannot yet be consumed, cried Holmes, and dashed into the cellar, to emerge some moments later in high spirits, carrying a charred leaf of paper in his hand. It is a pity, he cried, a pity, in spite of its questionable authenticity. It was a noble specimen. It is only half consumed. But let it burn away. I have preserved one leaf as a souvenir of the occasion. He folded it carefully and placed it in his wallet. Mr. Harrington Edwards, I fancy the decision in this matter is for you to announce. Sir Nathaniel, of course, must make no effort to collect the insurance. Let us forget it, then, said Mr. Harrington Edwards with a sigh. Let it be a sealed chapter in the history of bibliomania. He looked at Sir Nathaniel Brooke Bannerman for a long moment, then held out his hand. I forgive you, Nathaniel, he said simply. Their hands met. Tears stood in the baronet's eyes. Powerfully moved, Holmes and I turned from the affecting scene and crept to the door unnoticed. In a moment the free air was blowing on our temples and we were coughing the dust of the library from our lungs. Chapter 3 They are a strange people, these book collectors, mused Sherlock Holmes as we rattled back to town. My only regret is that I shall be unable to publish my notes on this interesting case, I responded. Wait a bit, my dear doctor, counselled Holmes, and it will be possible. In time, both of them will come to look upon it as a hugely diverting episode, and will tell it upon themselves. Then your notes shall be brought forth, and the history of another of Mr. Sherlock Holmes's little problems shall be given to the world. 
It will always be a reflection upon Sir Nathaniel, I demurred. He will glory in it, prophesied Sherlock Holmes. He will go down in bookish circles with Chatterton and Ireland and Payne Collier. Mark my words, he is not blind even now to the chance this gives him for a sinister immortality. He will be the first to tell it. But why did you preserve the leaf from Hamlet? I inquired. Why not a jewel from the binding? Sherlock Holmes laughed heartily. Then he slowly unfolded the leaf in question and directed a humorous finger to a spot upon the page. A fancy, he responded, to preserve so accurate a characterization of either of our friends. The line is the real jewel. See, the good Polonius says, that he is mad, tis true, tis true, tis pity, and pity tis, tis true. There is as much sense in Master Will as in Hafiz or Confucius, and a greater felicity of expression. Here is London, and now, my dear Watson, if we hasten, we shall be just in time for Zabriskie's matinee. That is the end of The Unique Hamlet by Vincent Starrett. Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio, 2022. Thanks very much for listening, everybody, and um, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. There's a bell that you can hit which will give you notifications of when I come up with my next um, riveting story. Um, you can support me on Patreon or on buymeacoffee.com, as I think it's called. Anyway, thanks for listening again, and uh, take care. Bye.